Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, I'm Phil Bernstein. Um, it's a pleasure to be introducing James Terwilliger um, to this morning. James um, had a great visit last summer to MSR, where he um, did work on mapping um, link link queries to schematized XML data. Um, today, he's here to talk about his PhD thesis research on graphical user interfaces um, as updatable views. Um, James has a lot of experience in um, several years of commercial um, development in addition to his PhD work, so um, I'm sure it's going to be interesting to see how he'd like the environment, to understand how he'd <laughs> like the environment for, um, for developers to look like in the future. James, thanks for So good morning, everyone. Um, wow, echo. Excellent. Um, the title of my talk today is graphical user interfaces as updatable views. But just as a point of clarification, uh, I'm not talking about taking a graphical user interface and magically transforming it into a gra a, an updatable view. What I mean is they already are one. Your GUI is a view, and it is updatable. And what we want to do is leverage that in a way that can pr provide some very interesting results. So. We're going to take the graphical user interface, treat it as a conceptual model for the, t for the uh, data in the database, allow developers to program to that data model, and also uh, come up with a new way to map uh, the user interface data to physical schema called a channel, and we'll talk a lot about that. But first, a reminder of what we're talking about. This is a, a form from a, a, a commercially available piece of software that does uh, clinical endoscopies. Um, Everything on this form in terms of its structure should be very familiar. You have things like radio arrays, text boxes, list boxes. And the terminology you might not understand, but if you happen to be in the field of clinical epidemiology or endoscopy, or even if you were a statistician who was running queries on clinical data, you would understand what, say, ASA or NSAID or any of these things meant. So this is a form that was designed specifically for use by a domain expert. Forms are everywhere. This is an example of one built in ASP.NET. Uh, this is a web form uh, that does site management and content management. So same kinds of graphical things are in play here. Text boxes, you have a, uh, uh, a tree view. Same kinds of controls at work. And because this paradigm of software development is so popular, there are lots and lots of tools out there dedicated to the purpose of designing these things. So this is one from. Uh, Eclipse that does uh, standard window toolkit user interfaces. This is one from Microsoft Access. Microsoft has a brand new one based on uh, uh, the new uh, .NET framework, in this case uh, called Expression Blend. But the one that we're all most familiar with in this room, I would imagine, is the form builder that comes with Microsoft Visual Studio. And I think uh, we've all pretty much used this software before. Uh, you have some sort of a toolbox of common controls on the left-hand side. And when you drag and drop one of these controls onto the field of the form, uh, you see a graphical representation of that, but then you also, behind the scenes, get all the code necessary to generate that form. So what we have done is put together a framework we call GUI as view, or graphical user interface as view. And this software starts with a UI designer or developer uh, programming a user interface using a familiar tool, Visual Studio, in the familiar way, with no changes. Uh, except that we ask the developer to use the Guava library of widgets instead of the Visual Studio widgets, and which happen to be identical. The Guava library is merely an extension of the Visual Studio components. And from that, we generate quite a few things. We generate the default database instance and schema. We generate all of the insert, update, and delete statements necessary to communicate between the user interface and the default schema, as well as the data bindings. And then there's this additional little piece, an application-specific query interface. I'm going to talk at great length about that. 
So what you get for free is a fully functioning database-backed application with the default schema. And you can think of this like a user interface to re relational mapper for which you can come up with your own acronym, and I provide three possibilities for you. Um, subsequently, a database a developer or designer might come in and decide that that default schema that comes from the user interface might be insufficient for various physical reasons. And so we also provide a declarative mapping that the, develop that the database developer can use to transform that schema based on whatever physical design they have in mind. So what do we do on beneath the scenes? You start with this user interface built on the graphical user interface library we provide. This generates a structure called the G-tree, which is a hierarchical representation of all of the data in that application. From that, you get the default instance of, of the database with the schema and all the bindings, et cetera, that are necessary to communicate with the UI. You also get a default mapping to physical database. This is called a channel. I introduced this briefly in the subtitle of the talk. And this fu functions very similarly to what you think of as middleware in a three-tier application. You get a default one for free with Guava, but the database designer can come in and modify that over time. Finally, given a natural schema and the channel, we give you the physical database instance. Obviously, there's more to a piece of software than just a UI and the database transformations, so we offer various ways for business logic to interact with all of our default mappings. You can intercept the default mappings and rewrite them, or you can completely escape the system. But what the most interesting arrow is the one between business logic and natural schema, because we allow the developer to code directly to the natural schema and transform all of those statements as necessary. Just for scoping information, what we're currently looking at is a situation where you have a single user interface application uh, running on top of your physical storage. We have some ideas for how to get multiple applications to, to work together. I can talk about that later if people are interested. But for the purposes of this talk, we're looking at one UI per application. And we're also looking at building new applications. So if you have an existing application, you might want to translate to using the Guava GUI, but we're, or the widget library. But we're primarily focused with, you have a new application you're trying to build, and we want to give you all of these things for free. Just to clarify, when you yes. said a single GUI, you, mean, you don't mean one form. Do oh, you? no, I don't mean one form. I mean a single GUI application. So you, you might have, uh, say, a, you might have a situation where you have an entire uh, graphical user interface for, say, billing, and then another one for endoscopies, and another one for such and such. We're focused for, say, the entire one for the endoscopies. There can be lots of, as many forms as you want in the application. Um, the final piece that we give you is this application-specific query interface. And this is of, of vital interest to us because, first of all, this was the uh, entry point for us into this research. Um, and so we're going to be talking, or I'm going to be speaking about these two components mostly for the talk. And the reason why, we want to give people who have domain expertise the ability to write queries against an interface that looks like this, that was designed with care and understanding of a domain expert in mind, as opposed to having to write queries against a database, even with the help of a data dictionary, which might not be available. So we want to give people this instead of what, we, what you have here. We see that as a much better view of the data. So the uh, contributions that we see of this work uh, we, first of all, provide the library of the UI-driven development so that you can, as a user interface designer, start with your, your UI. And we'll explain why we think that's a very good uh, way to, way to uh, approach to designing software. Also, we provide the architecture and algorithms to get from the user interface to your default schema and your query interface. And that constitutes the first part of the talk. Um, and second, also, we give you the, the schema language and an implementation of that schema language to transform all of these default things we give you into something more physically appropriate. And that constitutes the second major portion of the talk. Also, we have an end-to-end -end prototype that we've implemented, um, applied to a practical application that we've been working in concert with uh, an actual uh, software development uh, group. Um, and I'll touch on that as I look at the other two topics over the course of the talk. So that's how today is going to uh, the today's talk is going to proceed. Uh, we're going to start with the user interface because that's where the architecture starts. Um, so first of all, user interface. The user interface is a conceptual model. 
It's, it's a conceptual model because it has all of the various things that we think of as being in a conceptual model. We have entities, we have attributes, and we have relationships between those things. And those correspond in a natural fashion to the constructs you see in forms in a user interface. So a form becomes an entity, or say a grid control on, an, on a form becomes an entity. <clears throat> the attributes of the forms are the text boxes, the lists, the radio arrays, those various things. And the relationships in a user interface correspond to the relationships between the forms. So modal relationships, launch relationships, or say lookups between one form and the data in another form. So whether or not you know it, the uh, database developer, or the UI developer when they're writing a UI is in fact designing data. They're writing a conceptual model. In fact, it is the conceptual model that the user interface sees, which is very important for cer certain kinds of software development processes like rapid prototyping and agile methods where the customer is very much integrated in the design process. And so providing the, a, a frequent user interface to understand what the, con the contents of an application is, is very important. The key structure in all of our, our uh, artifact generation is this thing called the G-tree. And it's a tree because uh, the, the nature of a user interface is that it's hierarchical. And it's, it's hierarchical in two senses. It's hierarchical based on the controls within a form because you have a containment relationship between controls in a form. And it's also hierarchical based on the launch relationships between forms. And that's the essence of what a G-tree is. You're stitching those two hierarchies together into a single hierarchy that represents all of the data that's present in a single application. Um, each node in a G-tree contains uh, information about the control it represents. So that includes things like the domain of the control, but it also contains information about the context of the control, and that's important for generating this query interface. So we'll gather information like the, the text that appears before the control, or one of the more interesting things, I think, is the uh, tooltip uh, that, that appears when you mouse over a control. All of those things that provide context to the user as they're using the interface. So, build, yes? Uh, for most applications, do you think that a tree is sufficient? Because you might have sort of like a back button that takes you back to a previous page, for example. So, so uh, for, for most applications, I've seen that a tree is sufficient because whenever you have something like a back button, that those two forms tend to have like a one-to-one -one relationship between those forms. Um, in which case you can encapsulate that as uh, like a, a collection of forms, but that they all have sort of a, you know, a single layer relationship between them. Like a, like a wizard interface is an example of that, where you have three or four different forms, and you can go back between them, but they're really all uh, a representation of a single entity. So this is a, an example application that you're going to see uh, for the next few minutes. It's a very simple part of an application, two forms. The relationship between these two forms is that when you click the details button on the form on the left, you get uh, launched the, the form on the right. And translating from this to a G-tree is relatively straightforward. You start with the, the top level form, call that an entity node because it's corresponding to a, a structure in the UI that is an entity. And you follow the control relationship down through the normal Windows forms hierarchy. But then when you get to a control like the details button, you have to follow the relationship across the details button to the new form. And that's how you stitch together the, the launch hierarchy with the control hierarchy. And what you get is, is a single tree. From the G tree, you also get a default database instance. And we call it the natural schema because it has a natural relationship with the user interface from which it came. So, uh, first of all, the domains of the various attributes are relatively easy to, to identify. So especially for something like a checkbox, you know that it's a, a Boolean. Um, for something like a string, you know that it's going to be something like a varchar with a, a character limit that matches the text box. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen bugs arise in software where the text limit of a, te of a text box and the width of the database are, comp are different, and that's what ends up causing the database problems, truncation without error. So you get the, the uh, lengths and, and domains of the, of the various attributes directly from the user interface, avoiding that problem. The translation from the whole G-tree to a relational schema is uh, you, you take the entity form or the entity nodes in the tree, translate those into tables, translate the uh, attribute nodes, and translate those into uh, 
the various columns in the, in the nearest entity node table, and there will be an example of this in one more slide. Um, the launch relationships between uh, forms turn into foreign keys, as one would expect. The difference is if you have a one-to-one -one relationship, like the, the example application I showed you a couple slides ago, that turns into a foreign key from primary key to primary key. And if you have a multiple launch relationship, or if you have something like new edit and delete functionality, where there's more than one, say, physician for a given patient, you, have a, a, you introduce a new foreign key column, and you create a foreign key from the new column to the parent table. Um, I'm skipping over uh, more complicated controls. I have an example of that if people are interested. Um, the basic idea behind a complex control is you can either just serialize it to a single element and call it just a single control, a single attribute in a table, or if you have some way of uh, breaking it down into entities and attributes, the developer can specify that in a semi-automated fashion. So for our given example, here was the G tree that we saw before. It had two entities, endoscopy and endoscopy details. And what, what's on the right is the natural schema associated with it. And you can see the foreign key between endoscopy details and endoscopy. And that foreign key induces a one-to-one -one relationship between those tables. So with that in mind, here's what we want to provide to a domain expert. This isn't the query interface we've impl implemented yet, but this is the one that we're striving for. And think of this like query by example. So if I'm trying to construct the query that I see on the bottom, I say, show me the endoscopist and the severity. Let's think of it like print nodes in QBE of endoscopies that have been completed where Bob was the anesthetist. You know, we physicians are on first name basis, you know. And where complications occurred. Very, very much like query by example. It's certainly our inspiration for this work. This is the inf interface that we have implemented. Um, it contains all of the same information that you saw in the previous uh, query interface. It's just in a different structure. And the structure you see, especially in the uh, main field of the query interface, is exactly the G tree. You're seeing the hierarchical representation of the entire user interface. And what you see on the right hand side is the context information for a particular node and the ability to specify a condition on that node. So what you see here is uh, specifying an equality condition for staff equals male. But then you're also seeing what was the tooltip. In this case, there wasn't any. But then also, what was the leading text? This is, yeah, the leading text was gender. And you can also see location and size information, which isn't as relevant. But we wanted to give you as much information as, about the context as possible. You can also see in this query interface, you have an advantage over the previous one in that you can search the QI. So if you want to find all locations in the entire user interface that, for instance, pertain to names, you just type in a contains name, and you can find all places in the UI where that information is located. So you can do a search on schema effectively. So specifying a query is like annotating a schema. GTree is like schema, so we're going to annotate that with the various uh, query parameters that we have. In this case, you uh, are printing the endoscopist and the severity, and we're applying conditions to anesthetist, procedure complete, and complications occurred. And the algorithm for translating this into a query is you start by taking the smallest possible subtree that contains all of those elements, and then translate that into using a relatively straightforward algorithm that um, the interesting part of the algorithm is that uh, the relationship of between entity nodes on the tree is governed by, the, by joins, as we would expect. So what you see on the left here is the relational algebra of the query that's specified. And this is relational algebra expressed against that natural schema, the default database instance. So, so if, if a form is used as a subform in multiple other forms, yes. it's going to be duplicated. So yeah, that's correct. So if, if I see a form such as, let's say there's a details form like medical history or something like that, that happens to be a child form of multiple parent forms, you're going to see it in, in, in multiple locations within the G tree. That's correct. Does that lead to any technical problems? I mean, that it's duplicated like that? So the, the biggest problem is that um, when it appears in the natural schema, uh, what you effectively has, have is a, a foreign key relationship um, from the details form to multiple parents, which is not normally allowed. Uh, so in Guava, we have a, a generalized notion of foreign keys that allows that to be possible. 
So in that case, you would have a foreign key from, say, details to colonoscopy and EGD and flex sig. It's, it's still a it's still a one to one. It, it could still be a one to one or a one to many relationship. It's it's just a disjunction. So you say, I have this entry in the details table, and it must be present in at least one of the parents. Uh, the expressive power of this query interface is um, uh, comparable to uh, conjunctive queries, except that it does not have a direct comparison between two columns with the exception of that restriction, uh, and we, we uh, allow joins across foreign keys as well. So it's, it's roughly comparable to, to uh, conjunctive queries, but strictly less. Now that's the expressive power of this query interface. Uh, similar to something like in uh, the entity framework, we also allow queries to be written directly against the conceptual model. Uh, this would be the SQL that corresponds to the queries that you saw before. Uh, the current implementation, the queries are specified in extended relational algebra. And if you express the query in extended relational algebra, uh, you can express any query you wish, not, not necessarily ones that are uh, in the query language of the, of the query interface we provide. Uh, there's a fair amount of related work in this area. Obviously, our inspiration for this work is query by example, but there are some other uh, research projects, new and old, pertaining to the information content of forms and also for um, presenting usable uh, user interfaces to, uh, to domain experts or people who are maybe not necessarily technical experts. Uh, we see is the advantage of, of our approach that we give it to you for free with the development process. Um, a few notes about the implementation of this part. Um, we started by extending existing Windows form widgets, so things like text box, radio list, all the normal things. Um, and because we did that, we allow uh, developers to use Visual Studio form, de form Designer in the normal way. You don't have, a, you have to use a special tool, and you don't have to use a special process, uh, with one exception I'm going to get to in a second. The natural schema object itself is implemented as a data set object, and for those unfamiliar with data set, that is an object that comes with the .NET framework that is an in-memory database, effectively, in-memory tables, and you can express relationships between them. And there's a, a thin API that sits on top of this data set that um, intercepts, uh, inserts, updates, deletes, queries, etc., and applies them both to the data set, but then also propagates it through the channel so that, it's so that it has effect on the physical database. Um, the one exception to use in the normal way is that the relationship between forms is implemented as a new property on clickable items, such as uh, um, hyperlinks or buttons. And the reason why is because we, we made an implementation choice early on that we weren't going to just analyze code. We weren't going to analyze the events between buttons. We were going to provide an additional feature so that if you wanted to click a button and have a form launch, we're just going to say, you know, just tell us what the form is you want launched, and we'll do it for you. And we do that behind the scenes using reflection. The query interface is implemented as a control that you just drop onto a form. So you can drop the query interface anywhere you want in the application, specify what the root of the tree is, and it will generate the query interface for you. Um, the way that the software works is when the application is launched, the framework loads the first form into memory and walks the hierarchy of the application, but does it behind the scenes. You don't see anything. So um, it walks the whole hierarchy, but you don't ever see any of that. Um, and also the application uh, includes OK and cancel buttons that are automatically hooked up to all of these uh, insert, update, and delete statements that are generated. You can override that if you need to, but the second you say, um, when you normally add a form to a project, you have a form that's derived from form, the class. In our case, you derive it from gform, and you automatically get OK and cancel buttons that you can override, but if you don't, you get all this default functionality. Um, there's a few lessons I learned from, from, from walking through this. The most important thing was that uh, modifying custom controls to work with Guava, so if there was a, a control that somebody wrote from scratch, um, we went ahead and uh, took a few examples of, of controls like this and modified them to work with Guava. And what we learned from that experience was that we didn't actually need to implement anything new. We just needed to change the existing functionality so that it met our interfaces. And that was important. We don't want, if a, if a developer is going to use this in the future, we don't want to impose an additional burden just so that things can work with Guava. So we found that to be very interesting and useful.
We also saw that it encouraged good encapsulation. So we saw at least one example of a custom control that was spread out over six classes. And yeah, six. Awesome. And uh, to make it work with Guava, it had to be encapsulated into one. Um, we have implemented a representative sample of the application that um, we've been working with. Uh, this is how it mapped out. We, we uh, converted a total of 361 controls. And the pertinent part of this pie chart is that the only ones we had trouble with were the two ones. And one of them was just because we didn't support the image data type at the time. And the other one referred to external data. So it just needs to bypass things and refer directly to physical storage. Everything else was a direct trend. It was either a direct conversion or had an obvious direct con conversion if we put a little bit more time into it. Um, I've already covered the query interface. In the interest of time, what I'd like to do is skip to a quick video demonstration, if that's okay. Um, so what I have is a video of the user interface part of Guava in action. So this is, first what I'm doing is I'm blowing away my database tables. See, nothing up my sleeve. Everything is generated automatically. So I delete my database, and I, I'm just going to reconstruct the root database. I'm not going to create any tables. And now I'm going to switch over to my development environment. And the first thing you're going to see is the code for a form. And you'll notice that the code for the form is pretty much empty, as you would expect. The only difference between this and the standard form template that you use is that we have an additional constructor that's used for the generation of Guava things behind the scenes. But you don't, the developer wouldn't write this code. The developer would just include this code in the project template. This is the form designer. Um, I'm going to click on a control in the form designer. This is the tab control. And if you look down in the properties window, you'll just see that it's a G tab control instead of a normal tab control. And here's a text box. It's just a G text box instead of a text box. That's the only difference to the developer is that you use the tools that are available in our, ver in our set of the text box like that. That's a G radio array button that you see there. And now we're going to run the application. The first thing to notice is the application comes right up. There's not a lot of overhead behind the scenes. We don't have the scalability results in a large application yet, but it's important that the application comes up quickly. Um, this is the query interface that corresponds to this application. I'm walking the control hierarchy. In this case, I'm looking at information about a patient. So to demonstrate how the QI works, I'm going to go over and add a patient. Because I've been feeling a little under the weather lately, I'll go ahead and add myself. My name is James Terwilliger. A little bit of background information. Go ahead and try this as your real social security number. I dare you. Uh, if I remember correctly, yeah, I have a little bit of a gender crisis there for a second, and okay. So I've just added myself as a patient. Now I'm going to go back to the query interface and do a very simple query for myself. I'm looking for the first name and last name of all males. I hit query, and I see that I get returned. And the last thing I'm going to show is that I am, in fact, in the database, that there's nothing behind the scenes working. So I switch over to my database. I refresh to make sure that the most current tables are there. I see that I have a, quite a few tables corresponding to the forms in my application. And if I open the contents of that table, I see that I have exactly one row that corresponds to me. So that is half of Guava. That is the half of Guava that takes a user interface and provides you all of the default information. From here, you know, I'll talk about the contributions at the end because we're a little low here on time. But from there, what we do is we work on the physical design decisions as implemented by a uh, database developer. So this is the part that takes the default schema and maps it to a physical database. Just as a reminder, we are here in the architecture. Guava does give you one for free. 
but the one for free is just a default mapping one to one. So if you want any physical design, this is where you put it. A lot of work has been put into creating database mappings and uh, physical design. Uh, in particular, relational lenses and both as view take a similar approach as the one you're about to see, which is a, an, a sort of an algebraic uh, operator at a time kind of approach. But there are other ones, including extract, transform, load. I hear there's this entity framework thing that Microsoft provides. Uh, um, so with all this stuff in, in mind, why is it we need a new one? Well, we have two groups of requirements here. First of all, the mapping needs to be able to handle a certain language of statements. It needs to be able to translate a certain number of things as expressed against the natural schema, translated into the physical schema. And that includes the standard queries and, and DML, insert, update, delete, but it also includes schema evolution. We want to be able to take uh, changes as specified against the user interface and, the, and therefore the natural schema and translate those into changes against the physical database and do that without any additional intervention. We also want guaranteed information preservation. And this is important because as we recognized in the title slide, graphical user interfaces are updatable views. And so we want to have uh, the user interface always be the definitive view of data. No, no weird side effects and definitely no loss of data. We don't ever want to be in a situation where we add a patient and it gets dropped. So we need information preservation and also key enforcement preservation. Um, but also the expressive requirements. Uh, uh, what do we want the physical database to look like in terms of the natural schema? Um, in particular, pivot and unpivot transformations. I, we've seen countless instances where the physical database will have uh, data that is in a generic format, whereas the natural schema of the interface would be in a specific format. And I'll give a concrete example of that in a slide or two. But the idea is that there are some expressive requirements we have that can't be necessarily met by any of the existing tools. So to say that slightly slower, there isn't a single one of the tools on the left that can give us all of the requirements on the right. And so we set out to develop an approach that can cover everything that's on the right-hand side. I mentioned a pivot. Uh, pivot is a relatively complicated transformation and is not handled by most mapping languages. In this case, if you start with the data on the left and move to the data on the right, it's called a pivot. If you go the opposite direction, it's called an unpivot. This is a transformation that's often used in data warehousing. Uh, you have things that are data on the left that are schema on the right, and that's what makes it very difficult for most modern map mapping languages, that they can't handle a mapping between data and schema like this. If you wanted to write an SQL statement that translated the left into the right, it would be what you see in the bottom right-hand corner. That's if you happen to be privileged enough to have a, a database like SQL Server with a pivot operator. If you don't, it is a left outer join nightmare. So this is the kind of complicated in, uh, mapping that we want to be able to support in our mapping language. So what is a channel? So as mentioned very briefly before, a channel is like this algebraic set of discrete transformations. You start at the natural database and you apply operators one at a time to the natural database corresponding to your physical design decision. And what you get after you apply the natural database through those transformations is what you get as your physical, your physical database design. Another view of this that's more graphical would look like this. So for instance, you're going to apply a horizontal merge to three tables T1 through T3 and they're going to unpivot that. And then separately you're going to take tables T4 and T5, merge them, partition them, do some additional operations to them. This is the exact same channel that you saw if I jump back for a minute. This channel is just a serialized version of this channel. This is just a more graphical way of looking at it. Um, what is also clear from this is that the exact output of this channel is determined by the input. So what do I mean by that? I haven't specified anywhere on these operators what columns or what the domains are or anything like that. And that's what's important for schema evolution in this point. So if I were to suddenly add a column for T2, hmerge knows how to handle the add column statement for T2, propagates that into an equivalent form, and pushes it through to the subsequent operators. We see this as a reasonably familiar design scenario for database developers because they've already got one that's similar, ETL. This is a screenshot just from Microsoft SQL Server Integration Services, but this is a relatively common type of tool that we see as familiar to database developers. 
our language of transformations is seen here. We have seven operations that we support. And these are the operations that are necessary to support the requirements as set out before. We have four um, operators designated for partitioning and merging various tables. We have pivoting and unpivoting, which is unique to our framework, to our knowledge. And also app apply, which can apply a, an invertible function uh, iteratively over the rows in a table. So this is our language of transformations. Uh, each operator can be defined in terms of extended relational algebra and can be defined in terms of how to translate an instance of the natural database into an instance of the physical database. Now, of course, that's not what's actually happening in a user interface. In a user interface, you have something like an updatable view, where you're executing queries, inserts, updates, other kinds of statements against the natural database, but you're not executing them there. You're propagating them through the channel. The statements that we support um, are queries and extended relational algebra, inserts, updates, deletes, um, some schema evolution uh, DDL statements, including adding tables, renaming columns, and so forth, um, adding and dropping foreign key constraints. We also have two additional statements. One is a looping construct that uh, is basically what it says here. For each tuple T in a query S, do the sequence of statements, or a query Q, do the sequence of statements S. And we also have an error check statement, which is if the query Q returns a non empty result, raise an error. This, statement, uh, this set of statements is closed under, my, under our transformations. What that means is that if you have any kind of statement of the form you see here and you push it through an operator, you're going to see a collection of statements here. You're not going to get anything bizarre, anything that operators don't understand. We need, the inf incidentally, the reason why loop and error are even in this list is for that closure property. So for instance, it is the case that there are there's the pivot operator, you cannot push an insert statement through without doing a little bit of additional processing. So how do we do this? Well, in the normal view, view fashion, you execute a query against the natural database, it's pushed through the operator, and it gets translated into a query in the opposite side. Uh, it's translated in, in a very similar fashion to view unfolding. So any references to an affected table is replaced by a subquery that is equivalent to the table you're replacing. And I have a couple of uh, information preservation formulas at the bottom. I don't expect you to follow them necessarily, but the, the uh, formulas themselves, what you need to get come away from it is uh, that the formulas themselves guarantee information preservation. So if you were to execute a query against the natural schema, what you get as a result is the result you expect. It is the result as if there were no operator there. Similarly for DML statements like insert, you execute the insert against the operator, and what you get is some sort of translation. The translation might not be an insert. The translation might be multiple statements. It might be things that aren't inserts at all. In this case, say it's an insert, an update, followed by some looping. It's still within that list of statements, but it is an equivalent transformation. And it's an equivalent transformation if the expression on the bottom is true, in this case for inserts. And what that big, long formalism there says is, if I run the query, the single table query T against the thing I just inserted stuff into, I should get back what I had before plus my new rows. DDL operates in a very similar fashion. The interesting part here is that a DDL statement executed against the natural schema may result in both DDL and DML on the physical side, but it's still closed. We, we, we know how to execute, or we know how to translate DDL, we know how to translate DML. Just to give you just a couple of concrete examples about these operators. Uh, this one's the vertical partition operator. Uh, vertical partition is you take the set of columns in a table and you distribute them amongst two tables. Uh, one reason why you might do this is if you have some sparse columns and you're going to separate those into a second table and make sure that if there's a row in the second table that's all nulls, that's basically, uh, you just don't include it. So it's a space save, potentially a space saving feature. Um, this is how you declare a v partition v part uh, in the lower right hand corner. As mentioned before, we need both a definition of the operator and then also a definition of their translation of statements. So in this case, you have a translation of the schema in terms of what the input columns and the output columns were of tables. And then you also have a translation of data in terms of relational algebra. So you see that the output instance of the table on the left is 
corresponds to the, the columns that we expect. It's a, just a projection. And then the output on the right is the same thing, except we're eliminating all of the empty rows. What is it you're propagating here? You've got the V partition as the operator. Yes. And then. So we're not propagating anything in this slide. This is, this is describing, this is dis providing a, a semantics to the operator. This is what the operator does. So if you were to, t to consider uh, the channel in terms of translating full instantiated instances of the natural schema into a fully instantiated instance of the physical database, this is how you would go about it. So it's got an input schema, it's producing an output schema, it's got input data, it's producing output. Correct. Um, and then we, we have to describe what we do with all the various statements that we support. So we, to give a couple of examples, if you see an insert statement, you break it into two insert statements, one on the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side. And the one on the right-hand side you can drop if it's not actually inserting anything other than the key. So notice that this insert has to respect the definition of the translation in the previous slide. And what I mean by respect is that you have the input instance, and then you have the input instance plus the inserted rows. And if you push both of those through, you should get what you expect. <coughs> Excuse me. Sa uh, similar process for queries. In this case, if you translate, uh, if you push a query through, you translate any references to this left table, and you translate that into a, a left outer join between the two output tables. And it's a left outer join specifically so you can recover those rows that you had dropped because they didn't have any information in it. A more complicated and significantly more interesting operator is the unpivot operator. Unpivot is uh, like a, the example that you saw before going from things as schema to things as data. So in this case, the before image of, an of a, a table is patient and you have a number of attributes corresponding to the, uh, the data for each patient. After you unpivot it, you end up with something on the right where you have effectively key attribute value triples. And this is a pretty common thing to happen in, the, in uh, commercial software. Um, you'll notice that the key has changed. It's now patient ID and attribute instead of patient ID. So a single patient's data is spread out over a number of rows in the patient table after you've applied the unpivot. Um, just like any other operator, we need to define it in terms of its semantics and also in terms of its translation. So we can demonstrate that its schema, the columns of the, the output columns of the table look like the original keys plus your attribute, val attribute column and your uh, value column. In terms of data, um, the output instance looks like this unpivot of the original input instance. And unpivot can be expressed in slightly longer relational algebra. You see the relationship here. Unpivot looks like a fair amount of unions put together. So you take something like the key and your social security number, and then you union that with the key and your name, and then union that with the key and so forth. Uh, insert statements translate into a number of insert statements corresponding to the various triples that you're inserting. And query replacement turns into, uh, tr translates all references to T to a pivot of T. And notice that this is the opposite of what we did with the data instance, because we're trying to effectively undo the transformation that we did to the database instances as a whole. So as you push the query through, every reference to T is going to be replaced with a pivot of T. It's true that not all DBMSs understand the pivot operator, but they always understand the left outer join version of the pivot operator. So. Uh, if the relational algebra ends up uh, being pushed to the database, when that happens, uh, if we can recognize whether it's a, a database that supports pivot, and if it doesn't, we replace it with the other form of the operator. So each operator has to support all of these information preservation conditions, and they can be spelled out like follows. Um, if I pose a query against the natural schema, I will get back the same result as if the, the physical schema matched the natural schema. So I'm not losing any data, and I get exactly the data that I, that, I, uh, that I want. And that can be any query. Any query I push through, I should get exactly what I want. No losses, no extra data. And then, for instance, the second example here, if I issue an insert, update, or delete, 
then I get exactly back what I would have gotten in the original table modified by my insert, update, and delete. So this is a fancy way of saying that my, uh, that working against the natural schema, the entire physical database should be transparent and completely lossless. And these statements can be formalized. You've seen a couple of these statements. Uh, there are five statements total. And each of these uh, correspond to one of the translations that you saw previously. So for instance, O query of QT means what is the query translation for the single table query referring to T? So this is, for instance, in the second one, it's saying if I push the query through and I execute it against the pushed through database after executing the pushed through DML, I'll get back exactly what I want. So this is all just a way of saying that I'm the, the, all those formalism is just describing the information preservation properties. Um, and it's just another way of saying that operator O must always return uh, what I expect when I issue queries or any other statements. Um, it's also the case that operator O for any operator must respect foreign keys. So that means that uh, if I insert something that would violate a foreign key as expressed in the natural schema, then something down at the physical schema must also throw an error. There's additional formalism to go with that, but I figured perhaps uh, this was quite enough formalism for one day. It's also the case that deletes must cascade, so all of the usual things we expect from referential integrity must also be true in the physical database. Uh, in terms of implementation of uh, this part of the uh, architecture, uh, just a, a couple of quick notes. The operators are implemented using the visitor pattern. Uh, we've gone through a couple of implementations of the channel, and the most recent one leveraged uh, my experience from last year as an intern working with Entity Framework. So I saw kind of what a, a, a good uh, design pattern for uh, translation of these things looked like. Um, Queries, DML and DDL, represent, are represented by syntax trees similar to canonical query trees or canonical command trees uh, here at Microsoft. Um, we've developed an ETL-like tool for designing channels. Um, we, used, we designed it using the uh, domain-specific language tool that comes with the Visual Studio SDK. Um, uh, we're still... Yeah, let, let me, as James checks his watch, yeah, next week. No, no, I, that's different joke, different joke. Um, yes, next week we're doing a, a, a comprehensive performance analysis on this uh, to verify this statement that time spent in the channel is negligible compared to the time spent executing anything else. This is a normal requirement of middleware in, 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 a, in software development. You can't have the middleware be the dominant factor or even a noticeable factor when it comes to uh, UI execution. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've been waiting to, to do this analysis until we, we were certain that we've done as much optimization on the output uh, SQL and also on the channel itself as we could. So I think we're, at that, we're ready to do that. Uh, I can say that when we ran these results last year uh, against a previous implementation, time spent within the channel uh, was about three orders of magnitude less than time spent within the database. So at that point, it met this, per, this hypothesis. We just need to retest that hypothesis. A uh, few more notes about implementation. Um, this is the amount of code it takes to implement each of these operators. It ranges from around 400 lines, or about 300 lines for a uh, function application up to about 800 lines. Horizontal merge is actually a little tricky because it's horizontally merging tables that might not be union compatible. The keys have to be union compatible, but the other columns don't. And so handling schema evolution in that case is actually kind of an interesting problem. So that's why it takes a little bit more code there. The whole code for the, for the whole framework comes to about 25,000 lines. Um, the UI library would be substantially smaller if it weren't for uh, the fact that we had some uh, orthogonal work that we were trying to, to relate Guava with some other research we were doing at Portland State. Um, this is also an estimated line. I'd say that if, in my judgment, I would say that the actual size of this was probably about 15% less, maybe around 22,000 lines of code or so for the whole application. Um, most of the effort in designing the channel went into establishing what the formalism was behind everything. Um, we went through a couple of iterations of that, uh, but defining what the action is of seven different operators on 15 different statements and then proving 
uh, the vast majority of those with respect to our, our formal equations did take uh, quite a bit of time. But once all of that effort had been done, it was a fairly straightforward process to write each one of the operators. So, what is it? so these proofs are, <coughs> excuse me, these proofs are against some abstraction. Of, you're, not, you're not proving code. No, we're not proving code. We're, we're, so we've got some spec for what the operator does. And then yes, so we, we define what the operator does uh, against instances of the database, and we, we treat that as the, the definitive semantics of what that, tra that operator does, is what it does to a whole instance. And then we verify that every single one of our statement translations uh, respects that um, and is information preserving. Uh, writing the SQL Server provider it was intricate. Uh, what I mean by the provider is the thing that takes those, those trees and translate those into the native syntax uh, of SQL Server. It was a little bit tricky because of things like uh, pivot and unpivot statements and function application. Uh, getting those to work correctly took a little bit of effort. But it is, it is up and running. Okay, so let's see. How are we doing on time? Good. So, uh, this is a, a, a section dedicated to looking at some of the current work and opportunities that we're doing with Guava. What I think I'll do is touch on schema evolution and then move to the conclusion. But if you're interested at all in how we're experimentally evaluating or uh, referential integrity or this thing called application operators, which are operators above and beyond the seven that we've described, um, I can come back to those things if people are interested. So in terms of schema evolution, you can think of the physical database in terms of uh, a function that takes in a UI and a channel. Because we have a default representation of a UI, and the channel is what d d transforms that into your physical storage. So how do you change the physical database? Well, you could have changed the UI, or you could have changed the channel. You could have altered the operators in it. Uh, so in the user interface, you might have added uh, forms. You might have changed some controls. You might have changed some context information. Uh, a lot of the changes that you might make to a UI would have a direct impact on the data that you want to store in your physical storage, but not all of them might necessarily do. Um, the channel will either um, propagate all of these changes automatically or in a very, very rare instance throw an error. And the only case that it would throw an error is something like you've added a control and somewhere down the line the name of that control happened to conflict with something, but in that case you would know exactly where the conflict happened and it would be a very easy resolution. Um, there's also the possibility that the channel itself might change, so you might, new, you might add new operators, change the physical design layout. Changes to the channel are uh, separate from changes to the user interface, so if you change the channel, the UI is completely unaffected. So the channel is mostly for designing the physical database. It has nothing to do with the UI. Um, Question? Yeah. You work on the UI. You mm -hmm. let's say you've modified a couple of things, and then you want to rerun the app. Yes. Um, so you batch up all these operations and compare the old UI with the new UI, and when you hit a five, you in place run the DLL, the, the DDL. batch operation, the DDL batch operations on the database. So yes. That's the deployment. So that's that is exactly the deployment. Is that um, you? You make some changes to the user interface. Those user interfaces. Uh, the user interface changes are captured atomically, so if you were to drop a control onto the form, it would register um, as a, uh, an, ad con an ad column against the natural schema in a, in a log behind the scenes. And then the next time you run the application, uh, the very first thing that happens anytime you run the application after it generates the G-tree is it pushes the, uh, it pushes the natural schema through to initialize the operators, make sure it's aware of all of the, the schema that's in place, and it will also generate the database on the other side. But if it notices that there were some um, DDL statements in the log, what it will first do is push through the old natural schema and then push through the DDL statements in that order. Um, <clears throat> so updates to the user interface, we've covered this a little bit. Um, but the, the key is that because the natural schema is, a, is directly related to the user interface itself, that uh, changes to the UI have a relatively straightforward correlation to um, uh, changes to the natural schema, which can be expressed in DDL, uh, just standard relational DDL, like alter table. Um, and here's where the changes made to the UI are recorded and translated into DDL statements that are packaged and, and pushed at a later time when it's necessary. 
Uh, you can do more complicated changes. I have a little bit of material if people are interested in how to do that uh, a little bit later. But the idea is that <clears throat> if you want to do something more complicated, like change the domain of a control, that, that can be expressed in terms of more atomic things. And we already know how to push the atomic things through. So actually, uh, in, in the interest of time, I'd like to skip forward to the conclusion. But uh, if people are interested, we can come back to some of these other topics. So future work and conclusion. What we see is the contributions of this work again. We see that there's a framework for generating a database-backed application from the UI, so a user interface-centric design methodology, which we think might support the uh, agile and like extreme programming kinds of software development. Uh, a, an application-specific query interface, which was our initial research question that we think that this, this, uh, this framework does in fact solve that research goal. Uh, we have an, a middleware abstraction tool for providing information preserving transformations that includes some expressive power that's not available in other mapping languages. Um, we see the channel as something that can be used uh, independent of the UI portion. So if you want an, an information preserving transformation just from one database to another, like let's say from your, uh, say your production database to your data warehouse, we see that as possible. Um, and then also a comprehensive approach to schema evolution, the attempt to be, the, the intent of which is to avoid having to write manual database up, upgrade scripts, which is a, a common problem I've seen. We have uh, four publications to date. So th uh, this work is out there. Uh, all of the, one major aspect of future work we see is seeing whether the channel is applicable in the alternative data models. So, so far, uh, everything you've seen is in the relational model, which has the advantage that there is a well-understood DDL language on, in, on how to translate one schema to another. Um, alternatively, we might look at XML, see if we can have channels between XML and XML. Um, in terms of schema, XML, you can create schemas, you can drop schemas, you can validate data against a schema, but there is not yet a language for incrementally evolving XML schemas. Um, we might consider other models, RDF, et cetera. Or we might also have a situation where the natural schema is in uh, relational and part of the physical schema is in XML or vice versa. So having an operator that can do shredding or translation between models. To give you a taste of how XML would work, um, remember that a channel, you need uh, to know what the expressive power of the operators are, but then you also need to know what your list of statements are. So your list of operators would have to be things that are information preserving. Uh, in this case, you might have something like promote attribute to elephant, uh, to elef yes, an elephant in XML. Um, yeah, it's close to lunch, I think. Um, invert hierarchy within an XML would be an information, an interesting information preserving XML transformation. Um, so you'd have that definition of expressive power, but then you'd also have the list of, of supported statements. We know what queries look like in XML. We have several languages for that. XPath, XQuery, XSLT, all of those. Uh, we know that several databases support a, an XML, DML-like language that can do things like insert nodes, uh, change uh, individual values, et cetera. But the DDL is, is kind of the trick here. Is there's, no X, there's no DDL for XML, so what do you do when you want to evolve your XML schema? And there's a couple of possibilities. We could invent a language with the expressive power of XML that would be very hard. Um, you could do something like this last bullet, which we found kind of interesting, where you generate an XSLT against the schema, and we could translate that XSLT against the schema automatically into XSLT against the data, so that data that met the validation before would meet the validation after. Uh, other things, we're looking at pu pushing other things through a database, ch uh, through a channel. So physical constraints, uh, like uh, foreign keys we've done, but maybe other kinds of constraints we could push through. Uh, physical statistics, we've done a little bit of work on. So if you, if you know what the statistics are for uh, histograms, for instance, on the natural schema, we can give you close or estimated uh, statistics on the physical database. Um, we would like to uh, analyze this framework qualitatively, present it to some software developers, see what they think about it. Uh, I've, I've had some interaction with uh, some agile programmers who are very interested in this, but I'd like to formalize that kind of study. And then also another future work uh, possibility could be uh, how, do you, how could you construct a channel that gives you the maximum benefits? So use a channel for, phys for optimized uh, physical database tuning. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. <laughs>
because I was so eloquent and you've given it so many times you've already figured out where all the, <laughs> all the questions lie um, you think that you talked a bit about XML at the end I mean do you think that that would be actually a good thing to support XML in the database or do you think it's just I mean would it actually benefit the framework or is it just something that you would do because felt the need to have XML in the database? Um, well, it's, it's certainly the case that when I brought up this research in an academic setting, one of the first questions is, wow, this is really cool. Can you do it in XML? Um, so at the very least, there's, there's some interesting research question there. Um, in terms of its, its application to uh, actual software engineering, it's, I haven't seen very many software applications that use XML underneath natively. Usually they have a data set or some other relational-like structure that they bind to. But it might certainly be the case that even though it's bound to relational in the natural schema, it might use an operator to translate to XML on the way to storage and actually store it as XML, sort of a channel to stored XML, if you will, um, and then have XML translation that would further optimize at that point. So that's, that, that's where I see XML channels as being more likely, is you introduce XML in the channel, and then you actually apply operators from there. Any sense of, um, presumably this is supposed to improve productivity of developers putting together these sorts of applications. And obviously the query interface is a nice, that's better functionality, but mm -hmm. you're automating so much, I guess the idea is that this would be a more productive environment for people. Do you have a sense of how much more productive? So I've, I've had a few master's students work with me over the past year or two, and um, their reaction to this was, I want it, I want it, I want it. Um, uh, I've worked with one or two people who work in, who uh, as their profession do agile development and they gave me a, a pretty similar reaction. Um, I think that it's, it's a big open question in terms of the best way to interface the business logic portion with the stuff that we generate automatically. Uh, we provide one way of doing it but we, we're not sure that's the best way to do it and so we, we'd still need more results on that. Yeah? Did you do uh, any uh, uh, surveying of uh, medical people to ask them how they would respond to this. I mean, I, I noticed that you're, this is a uh, done with uh, some sort of a grant from medical. Uh, yes, so uh, the, the majority of this work was done under the Collins Medical Trust grant and also NSF grant at the bottom. Um, we've been working pretty closely with this software development uh, group underneath Oregon Health and Science University that includes uh, physicians, it includes um, clinical terminology aware statisticians, so people running uh, data warehouse type queries over a data warehouse but who, who are required to understand clinical terminology not to a diagnostic level, um, and then also developers. So everywhere from developer on the scale all the way to total domain expert. And within this group we've demonstrated both the query interface and the software development to, to each phase of that and that's where our feedback has been coming from. Um, it is, it is certainly the case that we want to open this up to evaluation by, by more people. So have any of the medical people actually tried to generate an application using this framework? Not yet. Not yet. So, so far we've been um, translating the application in-house, but having developers you know, look in, but it's still at, at an informal level. You said you didn't actually do this. This query interface is very cool, but then in the end you have this more generic kind of mm -hmm. implementation. Is that just level of effort or were there, are there technical There's impediments? There's one technical impediment, but beyond that it's all level of effort. It's all just coding. And the level of effort comes to, let me skip forward a few slides since I have other things. And animations apparently. And uh, here it is. So the control that you see on the right is one that's directly out of the application that we've translated. They do that. They draw pictures. And yes. That so th they, they provide the stomach uh, in the control. And then what you do in this control is you either draw a little area or click a little button, and it will come up with a findings window and says, what finding did you find at this location? And then there's some, fu some functionality behind it. Um, this control is easy to guavaize. It has a very simple relational background, so we didn't change any of the, the behavior, and this control works in guava, and it's beautiful, and everything works well, and how do you query it? That's the technical impediment, is you have a complex control like this, 
what does this control look like in the query interface? We've actually given this one a query interface. We, we um, modified the behavior of the control slightly so that you can toggle between query mode and data entry mode. And the query mode looks like you draw a, a rectangle and it translates that rectangle into, did I find a finding within this, this boundary? Um, but that's certainly not the only queryizable version. It's, it is definitely the case that for every complex control like this, you would impose on the programmer the need to come up with a query version of it. That is a technical limitation that is not present in the current implementation because all you're seeing is the G tree. So you don't have to implement any additional things behind it. So we, we, we can queryize this, but it's not automatic. It, it requires extra stuff. Yeah. So this kind of touched on my question. I was kind of just wondering if you're targeting some specific class of applications, uh, graphical applications, because the examples seem to be very easily mapped to a relational data model. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering, right, you know, if, if there's some specific target you're looking at. Good question. So I, I don't know if the microphone caught that, so let me repeat the question. The, the question is, was, the, was this framework uh, geared toward a particular um, class of application uh, based on maybe its, its internal data model, et cetera. Um, it's, it's been my, my experience working in development that a relational data model under, underlying it is certainly the most common thing right now. So gearing it towards a relational model, I think, um, isn't as much of a restriction currently. That may change in the future. Um, it is also the case that we're, we're geared towards data entry centric applications. So if you had an application that say, it was a graphical user interface, but it was all for the monitoring of sensor data. Um, it's not clear to me how to guavaize an application of that character yet. So th this is certainly for the case where you're both entering and viewing data, not just viewing data. So that, that, that does narrow the class of application down a little bit. Uh, to give you an example of an application like that, I once worked for a company that did um, uh, software for uh, silicon manufacturing. It was just basically a gigantic microscope that did a bunch of readings and millings on silicon, and this would not be applicable to that application. It had a database, it had a user interface on top of the database, but it was all about visualizing. And so it's not clear how I would apply this to that kind of application. Thanks again. Thank you.